Hey everybody, it's Dr. John Thomas again. Uh, I am here today with a very good friend, uh, Gene Johnson. I wanted to talk to him a little bit about uh, his experiences uh, in his career. I think you guys will find it uh, very interesting and hopefully enlightening. Uh, I try and talk a little bit about resilience and what that means for us in our lives. And today we're gonna to talk about that and probably a few things that, that stand in the way. So uh, Gene, why don't you start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Um, so my name is Gene. I uh, am currently a registered nurse. I work in surgery. Uh, I've been doing this for about four years. Um, Besides that, uh, I'm back in school. Uh, I went to Montgomery College and got my associate's degree in nursing there. And I'm currently at University of Maryland, um, the online campus, getting my bachelor's degree. Okay, okay. Um, so why nursing? Ooh, ah, so I've always loved science. That's always been a thing. Um, ever since I was a kid, I've loved science. Um, growing up, I realized that my parents are a little bit older than most parents. Um, and therefore they uh, developed health issues uh, that other parents didn't have, um, such as diabetes, hypertension, um, things of that matter. And I've always wanted a way to help them. And therefore um, going into health science um, just seemed like the best route for me. Not only that, but it's a reliable job. A reliable job. You know, I won't have to um, won't have to search for a job very uh, often, or it's not it's not hard to get a job in a nursing field um, as long as you know your stuff. Okay. Now, uh, I'd like for you to uh, tell us a little bit about your job. Uh, I think the only time I've ever been inside uh, an actual operating room is me watching television. So I know uh, on television, all the nurses do it are like hand instruments to the doctor. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling like what you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is probably a little bit more uh, complex than that. So why, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do from day to day? Um, so talking about the TV shows, um, <laughs> very quickly, I learned that TV is not <laughs> what it looks like in the operating room. Um, for instance, like the, what you said, the passing the instruments, I'm typically, uh, I don't do that. Uh, that's, we have surgical techs. Um, we also have nurses that can do that, but my job is a circulator. So, so say we open a room for a surgery. Uh, it's my job to know the patient information, know their past medical history, what surgeries they've had, make sure their labs are um, sufficient for the procedure and if uh, what medications are on. And if I find something weird or off, or if they're missing a test, like for nowadays, like most of our surgeries, you have to have a coronavirus test before you can have it done, unless it's an emergency. So I have to be on top of that stuff. And if I see some the discrepancy or anything like that, I communicate to my surgeon, to my anesthesiologist. Um, it's also, it's pretty much a very close working team between myself and the surgical tech. So if there's something I don't know, then they would most likely know it, especially if they've been doing this a lot longer than I have. A lot of our surgical techs have, you know, so um, typically I consult with them to figure out what we need for the case. So specific instruments, specific sets, trays, what um, disposable stuff we might need, you know, we kind of discuss that. And um, if there's anything that I do not have in the room during the procedure, then it's my job to sprint down the halls and um, collect whatever they need or to call my charge nurse to figure out if I don't know what it is, you know? And um, 
another very important aspect of this is um, specimens. A lot of times when people come in for surgeries is to collect, you know, a culture, a biopsy, a specimen, and it's my job to make sure that I get the proper name, um, whatever fixture it's supposed to be in, whether it be formalin or saline or if it's going frozen, things like that. Um, and that's one of the most important parts of the surgery because if I don't, then, you know, the whole, the whole reason the person came in for surgery is now null and void and they have to do it again. Okay. You mentioned the, the, uh, the coronavirus. How has the virus changed the environment of the hospital? Um, in the beginning stages, it was, it made the environment very tense. Um, kind of, there was a sense of uncertainty, but that, uh, what we felt in the hospital was more, it was more of on a greater scale than I want to say outside the hospital, because you know, for a fact that you're in the healthcare field and there's a much higher chance I'm going to come in contact with somebody who has it and I'm going to know, you know? And so, um, we do have coronavirus patients that have surgeries in our hospital. And, um, one big way the environment has changed also is the fact that I now have to wear, you know, a ton of things that I, uh, I didn't have to wear before, such as I'm constantly wearing a mask. I haven't seen a coworker's face in a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time, you know, unless I happen to see you walking in with me or we happen to get a dinner break at the same time. I, I forgot what you looked like, you know, <laughs> um, besides that I'm wearing, I'm wearing goggles all the time. I'm wearing two masks. Um, I'm wearing, I'm wearing another gown, you know, it's, it's, um, a lot of, a lot more safety precautions. It's, it has become a little bit more tense around the environment. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, besides some of the safety precautions, uh, that you guys have, have to take, how has the coronavirus changed your job specifically? Um, there is a lot more preparation for my procedures. Like I said, um, there were certain labs that I would look for. I now have to look for this test specifically. I mean, it's just to protect, you know, the team that goes in the room, I have to look for this test. Or the people in the hallway, if they don't have this test, I'm like, you don't, you know, do that test first and then come to us, you know, just to make sure that safety is upheld out, um, throughout the whole unit. Um, another preparation I have to do is, like I said, if, if I can't find this test in the computer, I have to call the staff upstairs, figure out if it's been done. I have to call the lab. You know, if, if I'm for sure getting a coronavirus patient, then the preparation for my room has to change. I now have to change the air pressure in the room. Um, I have to stick up signs on the doors. I have to, um, set up a machine that helps to change the air pressure in the room and the machine has to be turned on for 20 minutes. And so, you know, there's a lot more setup than what there used to be. Okay. Now, have you seen burnout in your coworkers? Um, yes, I have. Um, I've seen it within myself. I've seen it within my coworkers. I've seen it within my, you know, my, my bosses, my charge nurses, the, the surgeons, you can see it. Um, the attitudes, um, it's not very often. We, we have very good poker faces at work. So it's not very often that you can see, you know, that someone is anxious about doing a case with a coronavirus patient or, you know, just tired in general, because one thing that you will notice is that in my particular hospital, we, well, no, over in the state of Maryland, you know, they, they passed a, they passed this rule where you couldn't do elective surgeries for a long time. And so what we found is that a lot of places, it seems as though a lot of places had surgeon surgeries that needed to go that were elective. And so now they're kind of, it's a backlog. 
And so there are certain days where you're working and you're like, I, um, I come into work and there's like a ton of extra surgeries and I'm like, uh, I can't remember if this was like this before the virus or is it because of the virus, you know, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. hard to, it's hard to remember what it was like before. <laughs> wow. Um, that's a huge statement. Uh, I think we're depending on on when you start the count, maybe seven, eight months into this thing, yeah. uh, not being able to remember a time when it wasn't this way. That's, uh, that's a big statement. Um, you mentioned one of the things, uh, about what burnout looks like, uh, in your coworkers, um, when you were experiencing burnout yourself, what did that feel like? Um, it felt like, honestly, it felt like I needed a vacation. That's what it felt like. I felt like, you know, stress manifests in people differently, but it felt like there was like this knot in my chest and I couldn't quite, quite place where, it, you know, where it was coming from, you know, cause you know, this, this pandemic causes stressors in the house and <laughs> work you know, just in your thought process. And so, um, that's kind of what it felt like I was, um, I'm tired more. Um, I feel like I need a vacation. You know, you find yourself kind of, your, your thought process kind of changes. The way you react to things changes well. Like certain things will annoy you that wouldn't before, or you take things to, you take things personally a lot more often you mm -hmm. know? and you know it might, it might just be the same event it might be the same event you've experienced before but because of the extra stressor you react differently um is there anything else that you can think of that that level of stress affected in you or in your personal life uh, it definitely affected, it's, it's affected my family for sure. Um, you know, I, I just got married two years ago and our second anniversary was in July and we had planned to, we had planned to go on a trip. And of course, you know, no one's plans went into fruition unless you're willing to take that risk. And that's not what I'm willing to take, you know? But, um, so we kind of, you know, we kind of managed at home, you know, but it was clear that, you know, we wanted to go places. Um, the, one of the biggest changes for me has been the fact that, uh, so my, my parents are older. My, my dad is, he was born in 43, my mom was born in 54. And so they're, like I said before, like when I, the reason why I got into nursing is because they're older than most parents. And, um. Because of that, I'm a little bit more, I'm very cautious about interacting with them. Um, I honestly haven't been in my parents' house since before March. I talk to them on the phone, but typically it's, we meet on the front porch <laughs> if I do go and I wear a mask. So they probably haven't seen my face in forever. You know, that's, that's one of the harder, uh, one of the harder things that I've, I've been going through um, and not only that but hanging out with my friends has been very very far uh, few and far in between like before like one of, one of my biggest stressors was just to show up at a friend's house randomly and just go inside and chill on the couch and talk for a bit but I really um, haven't done haven't done that and that's like, so now it's mostly uh, online uh, voice chats and stuff like that, which is still fun, but you know, it's it's never going to be the same as going to see somebody's face and right, and, yeah. But that's that's what we're left with. It is, yeah. Unfortunately. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to end up doing with all of my family a. <laughs> Uh, instead of a Thanksgiving, we're going to have a Zooms giving. Yeah. 
Yeah. That that's just the way things are working out. Um, so I just have two more questions really for you. Uh, and it's something I'm really, really interested in is what you think uh, your hospital or its staff does well in supporting you guys' resilience? Um, one of the issues that has greatly improved is the the protective gear that we have in the hospital. And um, starting out, we ran into an issue where, I'm not sure how many facilities ran into an issue in the area, but there was a shortage. And I think, you know, a lot of people know there was a shortage, mm -hmm. but unless you're in a hospital, you don't realize how crucial that shortage is. Because, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's literally a safety issue. Like you're gonna be talking to this person who might have it, or actually does have it, you know has it, and if you don't have the proper gear, then you're already engaging somebody with a certain level of stress. And so um, I have to you know, tip my hat to them because whenever I need a mask, whenever I need a face shield, um, they are, they have it, you know, which is great because now I'm, I'm, I'm really not bothered, you know, dealing with a patient, maybe it's because I've, after doing it for so often or, or for so long now, I just know what I need to do. You know, it's, it's not an issue. Um, it's just been reassuring to know that I have these things on, on hand. Yeah, I do remember that time when everybody was trying to figure out where we're going to get all of this protective gear from. Uh, now it's, it's almost ubiquitous. You know, you can uh, go into any store, uh, see people on the street with stands or, you know, um, so that, that's at least for me personally, I know that's, that's been a, a big comfort. So last question. Okay. It's pretty much the same. Uh, you told me what your hospital has done well to support your resilience. What do you think is working for you that helps support resilience? Uh, um, I have found new ways of of dealing with kind of my stress. You know, I've been, I found new ways. Like, uh, so I've been, I've been running and I was okay with running, but I wasn't very good at it. And one thing that I'm not going places. So the pandemic has given me time to YouTube videos on running form. And after that, it's just kind of, I've been taken off. Like I've, I've got like a, a group that I run with, you know, which is, which is very crucial to my mental health. Um, I got a therapist during the pandemic, <laughs> which has been, uh, which has been great. We got a, two therapists actually, one for my marriage, which is affected by the virus and one for me and my own health, which is affected by the virus. Um, so between, you know, exercising, um, talk to somebody about what's going on in my life, um, spending more time with the wife, which is uh, a plus side of the virus, which, you know, a lot of people don't say the plus side of the virus, but, you know, we both home. So <laughs> new movies, new shows, working out together, stuff like that. Yeah. So I wanted to say something uh, about this effect on family. Uh, one of the things that I found in the research that I've done on burnout is People are not burned out at work. And once you leave out of the door, <laughs> like you're perfectly fine. Yeah. You know, uh, the person going through that work stress is stressed out at work, on the way home, in the car, in the home. And everyone that I've spoken with uh, about this issue 
that had a family, um, they said that they were the only person that was burned out in the home, but that it affected everybody in the home. So for uh, uh, that, it had a negative effect on their spouse, a negative effect on their kids, and it seemed to present problems that for a while they weren't even aware of and problems that they could acknowledge but had no clue how to deal with them, you know. And sometimes you get to a certain point where you look at it and say, this is really bad. and don't really attempt to change anything because it's so utterly and completely overwhelming. It seems like, yeah, this is really the best I have. Um, it's, it, it is really insidious. Um, and that's why I wanted to take the time to talk to medical professionals and have these sorts of dialogues. And um, I'm hoping that through this platform, people will get something of benefit for themselves and, and, and for their own lives. And if that's not enough, I encourage people to do exactly what you did, you know, and go, go find some help. Yeah. Uh, because there are definitely people out there who can help you uh, kind of make it through these issues. And I think that's real important. And uh, before we go today, I want to say something about that thing that I do uh, for my own resilience. Um, you already, of course, know what it is. Uh, I love martial arts. Um, now, martial arts and the coronavirus don't get along very well. And I have had to learn how to, for me to be able to do what I need to do, I had to make a big adjustment. So I had to learn how to take that platform and put it online. Uh, it's not the same thing. No. <laughs> but it is way better than just being upset because I can't do one of the things that I really enjoy doing. So uh, I want to encourage everybody out there um, to take charge of your own resilience because like I say every week, your resilience matters. Uh, Jean, I wanna thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, I know that this will be very helpful for a number of people. Uh, thanks guys.